Philosophy. Thanks very much, Neil. Uh, on many nights, on many basketball courts, Magic Johnson made people shake their heads with his incredible play. Today, he stunned everyone again with his incredible poise in telling the world he has the AIDS virus. I guess now I get to enjoy some of the other sides of living that because of the season and uh, the long uh, practices and so on. I just want to say that uh, I'm going to miss playing and uh, I will now become a, a spokesman for the HIV virus because I want people and young people to realize that they can uh, practice safe sex and uh, you know sometimes you're a little naive about it and you think it could never happen to you. Uh, you only thought it could happen to, you know, other people and so on and on. And uh, it has happened, but I'm going to deal with it, and my life will go on. Now, there are athletes, and then there are players who transcend the world of sports. In the 80s, three individuals reached that level, Wayne Gretzky, Joe Montana, and Magic Johnson. That's what makes today's news from Los Angeles devastating. Johnson, the large guard with the oversized smile, being taken away from the game he so loved was still so much more to give. If there was ever the perfect nickname for an athlete like Irvin Johnson, it was Magic, for he was that and just so much more. From his days in the 70s as an undergraduate at Michigan State, where he led the Spartans to the national championship, to just a month ago when he stunned Paris in an exhibition game with the Lakers, he produced from up an imaginary sleeve absolute brilliance. And because of that, he had an immediate impact on the NBA. He and Larry Bird came into the league on the very same day in 1979 and are generally credited with being the architects of the NBA's great rebirth. For openers, that a man six foot nine could play point guard was unthinkable. And play it with the kind of zest that Magic Johnson nightly displayed took that a step farther into incredulity. With that dazzling smile of his, he would cut down the lane, put opponents on their seats and pull fans off theirs. And from opening day a dozen years ago, basketball was never again to be the same. His Los Angeles Lakers won the NBA championship his rookie year, and they won four more in the decade to follow. He was the league's most valuable player in 1987, 89, and 90. All NBA every season from 83 on. The all-time NBA assist leader. He had not played in any of the Lakers' first three games of this season, suffering from what the team called dehydration from the flu which he reportedly picked up while in Paris on that preseason tour. Irvin Johnson, NCAA champion, five-time NBA champion, but just magic. Now, news of Johnson's condition reached the sporting world this morning. Here are some reactions from the people who played with Magic Johnson. It takes a lot of courage and guts to come out and even and tell the world this, uh, but I think the one thing... Uh, uh, you know, that it's, it's making him stop something that he truly loves and obviously could have done for a couple more years longer had it not been for this disease. I think it will just underline one more time the need for caution. And uh, that, that's uh, probably uh, one thing that Urban let past him. Uh, he wasn't cautious. You know, his luck ran out at, at, for that reason. I think he'll be a man who will champion the fight as he has done for us in professional basketball. You know, all of us have, uh, have watched him perform. We've been excited by his spirit, his emotion, his depth, you know, and how much he really cares about people. And I think more than anything now, all he needs is our support and our love. Of course, there is other sporting news. Edmonton Eskimos held a Clear the Air media conference at the Petroleum Club this morning to give their official stand concerning the events of the last couple of days. The TV package was put together in May, and as of this date, no one from the Eskimo organization has seen the TV contract. Well, I'm, I'm not disputing anybody's word, Donald Crump's or Cal Murphy's or anybody else's. The, all I'm saying is I didn't get the message. If, if somebody told me I either was not attentive or uh, didn't hear it or something. And there was some hockey action last night at the Coliseum. Oilers taking on the New York Islanders. First period, Essa Tikkanen from a sharp angle beats Glenn Healy, and it was 1-0 for the hometown club. 
And down 2-1 in the second. Vincent Danfus, plenty of time. No one challenges him. He comes right into the slot along the ice. He beats Healy through the five hole. And it was a two-all hockey game. Just seconds later then, Peter Klima with the shot. Peeking and going towards the net. He gets a stick on it for a second of the game. Oilers have a 3-2 lead. Great second period for the home team. Here, Vincent Danfus will stop along the boards and let the shot go. He has been struggling. He gets his second of the night. Oilers are up by a score of 4-2. They would add another one. Steve Weeks in the pipes now for the Islanders. Orders would score Peter Klima on the deflection. They go on to beat New York. They will be in San Jose tomorrow night, a game you can see on ITV starting at 8.30. And the University of Alberta Golden Bears annual Golden Bear Classic has begun down on campus. Eight teams are involved. Brock and UBC are the favorites, but don't count on the host Bears team. They take to the floor tonight at 8.30 against Winnipeg. Once again, our top story, Magic Johnson. Game tomorrow night against San Jose to start a junket. When I get uh, back with more sports a bit later on our Eyewitness Hour, we'll continue our series of Meeting the New Oilers. And Lisa Miller has a close-up look at Oiler assistant coach Kevin Primo. He's a product of the University of Alberta Golden Bear program, and he joined the Oilers this season after coaching in Europe for a few years. That's coming up in a few minutes' time. Daryl? All right, thanks, I think uh, Vincent Danfus looked very comfortable on left wing tonight. Uh, to me, he was skating better in that position, and he was handling the puck a lot more, getting more shots than he has in past games. And it's very obvious that uh, he has a, a liking for left wing as opposed to center ice. Danfus played on the left side on a line with rookie Joseph Berenick at center and Scott Mellonby on the right side. For some reason, I, I seem to get open uh, better, and uh, I feel when I'm playing at center, my back's a little bit to the play uh, most of the time instead of uh, going to the hole. And uh, uh, I don't know, it's just uh, I've been playing both for, for my career now, and uh, uh, I felt over the years that, uh, that left wing was a better, better position for me. You know, when John Muckler left the Oilers' fold and Ted Green took over the head coaching reins, the leading candidate for that vacant assistant position was Claire Drake, longtime Golden Bear mentor. But as it turned out, Drake didn't get the job. But ironically, one of his former players did. Lisa Miller profiles the Oilers' newest assistant, Kevin Primo. <laughs> Who's up? Today's new order is actually wearing the blue and orange colors for the second time. This former star of the Golden Bear hockey program played with the 1978 WHA Oilers. At 36 years of age, Kevin Primo is back, but as an assistant coach. When did it become a reality to you that you could not only become a coach in the NHL, but uh, do so in your hometown? It never really crossed my mind. Back then, you're, you're happy to have achieved that level as a player. Back then, the Oilers were, were WHA. It was fairly new, professional hockey even in Edmonton. And I know growing up as a youngster, you never you didn't relate to that as a goal because Edmonton never had a, a National Hockey League team back then. Kevin and Cindy Primo will raise Michaela and Josh in the same city where they both grew up. But they bounced around before landing back here. Kevin played in the 1980 Olympics, spent a couple of years in the minors, and the last few in Switzerland coaching. It was a pleasant experience. It gave me a chance to, to live in a different culture and learn a different language. Although I got many laughs trying out my German, it was, it was a really pleasant experience. Cindy, do you have any mixed emotions about having left Europe? Well, whenever, you, when you're, you're back in Canada, you miss some things about Europe, and when you're there, you miss the things about home, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it, I've always en enjoyed it over there, yeah. We're going to go to three on, three on three first with the guy jumping in late. This, we're going to call this the quick attack drill, because that's what we want to get on it. We want to get an advantage from the turnover. Assistant coaches don't often uh, end up taking a lot of the heat. Do you find as much pressure on you? Well, I think heat, heat pressure, whatever you want to call it, is, is pretty much what you put on yourself, I think. It's, uh, I feel uh, when, we, when we don't play well or when we lose, you, you dig in and work harder as a coach. Uh, feeling that there maybe was parts of the scouting assignment or whatever that you missed that you might have been able to do some things in, in terms of changing the results. You tell him to read the defenseman. When he sees the winger getting pinched off, he's got to accelerate and get up closer to him. You're close in age to some of the uh, older players with the Oilers, although there aren't many of those left. How do you find that uh, the players relate to you? It's uh, obvious that any 
Buddy coming in, any new younger coach has to go through a period where you have to earn your uh, respect and you have to demonstrate to the players that uh, that you have something to bring in terms of knowledge you've acquired over the years. So you get a little closer with the younger players, though, being a, being a new, uh, younger coach. Over the past two weeks, Eyewitness Sports has introduced you to the Oilers' future stars. Next week, we'll profile some of the people who work behind the scenes on game night. Join us all next week for Rink Rats. Lisa Miller, CFRN, Eyewitness Sports. Well, thank you, Lisa. With the Eskimo is idle and... Lawton won the draw, but Wilkinson had come in deep for the faceoff, and the puck went right by him. Bukaboom, kind of backhanded out. Lawton turns to the front of the goal. Ranford went down, and a terrific period for the San Jose Sharks. An abysmal effort by the Edmonton Oilers. The Sharks getting a standing ovation for what has to be the best period they've played all year. The Oilers, a gut test coming up for them. They need the next goal, and they need everybody working a lot harder in period two than they did in period one. The score after 20 minutes of play, the San Jose Sharks four, and the Oilers one. For Homer Office, supported by our sales and service team. The latest VCRs and camcorders for Christmas memories, plus everything in stereo to enjoy the season sounds. Exciting electronic action toys and video games for kids of all ages. All at Radio Shack, Canada's value leader in electronics. And now tonight's Out of Town Scoreboard, brought to you by your local bottler of Coca-Cola Classic. Can't beat the real thing. A 3-3 final in overtime in New York. The Rangers and the Leafs, perhaps a moral victory for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Bullard scores again in that one. The winning streak is over at nine games for the Montreal Canadiens. They lose 3-2 to New Jersey. Stefan Richet with a pair in that game. And a final just in from Winnipeg. Mario Lemieux with the third goal as the Penguins get by the Winnipeg Jets. Now we're going to the Cap Center in Landover, Maryland. The Capitals hosting the Red Wings tonight. Callie Johansson will score first in this hockey game, his fifth of the season. He leads Washington's defenseman in that category. It's a 1-0 hockey game. Nice play here by Gerard Gallant to set up Steve Eisenman. And watch as Eisenman gets three ties. One, two, and three tries. Third time lucky on the backhand. It's 1-1 after one period. In the second period, Johansson drop pass to Sylvain Cote. A shot here off Brad Marsh beats Chevelday, and it's 2-1 the Capitals in front. Big night for Bob Probert. He had a pair of goals. Nice play here to steal the puck. And he seems to fool Beaupre with this shot to make it 2-2. The Capitals, though, take the lead on the power play. Al Iafredi gets the goal. It's 3-2 for Washington. Jimmy Carson, though, having a great season with the Red Wings. And here he scores his 10th of the year. It's a 3-3 hockey game. Probert gave the Red Wings a 4-3 lead. And then Kevin Miller with a slap shot to make it 5-3 in the Red Wings' favor. Bob Probert scored one more. I should say... Christian scored one more for Washington. The final 5-4. Probert had a pair of goals in that hockey game. 5-4 the final. The Red Wings over the Washington Capitals. And in overtime tonight in Buffalo, Donald Odette with a goal as the Sabres get by the Philadelphia Flyers. And here at the Cow Palace after 20 minutes of play, the score of the Sharks for the Orders won. Second period action is next live on ITV. It's happening right now through this weekend. for it reaches in and he makes the save what a nice one but of course that is a penalty shot hey Murray Craven's having a good night so they give him the shot at the hat trick Murray Craven yes he had a couple of one-timers earlier but this time he gets poke checked by Chris Terreri Craven had to settle for a pair as the Flyers double the Devils four to two the Flyers first win of the year the Devils first loss in, uh, in, the, in the American Hockey League Cape Breton beat Moncton three to two as Max Middendorf uh, finished off a three-goal surge by Cape Breton as they came back to beat Mon Moncton 3-2. Salt Lake, the Flames team in the eye, was idle tonight. In the Western Hockey League, it was Kamloops over Portland 6-2. In overtime, Prince Albert got by Regina 6-5 as they returned from a 4-0 deficit. 
Saskatoon beat Seattle 5-2 in the other game in the Western Hockey League. In Alberta Junior Hockey League action, Dallas Ferguson of Lloyd Minster tied the score at 4-4 in the third period, and that set the stage for teammate Warren Smith to out last year. After all, that was the year when the big boom happened. In reality, it's been nearly a century since we've been able to collect hockey cards. It was 1910-11 when the Imperial Tobacco Company made the first set of cards. That set of cards, known as the C-56 series, is worth nearly $4,000 in near-mint condition. There aren't too many near-mint sets of those around those these days. Over the next 30 years, a number of tobacco and gum companies made sets of cards. Then, in, 19, in the late 1930s, Opeachy came on the market. Then, the hockey card industry took a break until after World War II. That's when Parker's came around. It was 1951-52 when Parker's issued its first set of cards. From that set, you'll find a $2,500 near-mint Gordie Howe rookie card. In 1954-55, Topps entered the market, and for the next few years, it was Topps and Parker's. Eventually, Parker's dropped out, and then it was just Topps. In 1968-69, Opeachy re-entered the hockey card market, and then for the next 20 years, it was just Topps and Opeachy, the affiliated companies from the United States and Canada. In 1990-91, three U.S.-based companies, Score, ProSet, and Upper Deck, hit the hockey card market, and that is when hockey cards really took off in the United States. Those companies had all been making other sports cards, which were very popular in the U.S., but once they entered the hockey card market, that's when things really boomed. Until next time, I'm Rand Simon for Collectibles Corner. Welcome back. I'm Jim Van Horn along with Bob McKenzie. My and sniper John Cullen says he's happy with his new contract. Well, so he should. Cullen, who was the fifth highest scorer in the NHL last year, signed a four-year, $4 million deal with the Whalers. Both Verbeek and Cullen were dressed and out on the ice tonight as Hartford took on the Montreal Canadiens. There's a look at Verbeek, and there's John Cullen, both figured in this game. Well, the Whalers had the only good scoring chance in the first period. Off the two-on-one, Mark Hunter feeds Jeff Sanderson, but Patrick Fouah, well, he does what he does best, coming up with a save. Early in the second period, Hartford on the power play. Cullen looks out front, finds Verbeek. Verbeek beats Roy, and the Whalers go up one to nothing. Well, midway through the period, Hartford, they're on another power play. This time, Cullen feeds Adam Burt. He blows it into the net, and the Whalers take a two to nothing lead. But late in the second, Mark Hunter gets a double minor for high sticky Guy Carboneau. So the Canadians take advantage. Just eight seconds left in the period. Kirk Muller, he'll tip in Stefan LeBeau's shot. And Hartford still leads, though, two to one after two. On to the third period, the Whalers up three to one, but Matthew Schneider draws the Canadians to within one, snaps it in past Whitmore. The Hads now down by one. But minutes later, Randy Cunningworth centers over to Sanderson. The shot will go in off of Paul DiPietro. The Whalers go up 4-2. to two. Jeff Sanderson there had the wind knocked out of him, but he was okay. The Whalers hang on to win the game by a score of 4-3. to three. Scoring for Hartford, it was Verbeek, Burt, Anderson, and Sanderson. And for Montreal, it was Muller with a pair and also uh, scoring Matthew Schneider. The New York Rangers will be without veteran Tim Kerr for up to four weeks. Kerr suffering a separated right shoulder in Friday's game against the Washington Capitals. It's just another in a long line of injuries for the veteran player. He's already had eight operations on his other shoulder. Tonight, the Rangers and the Caps had a return engagement, this time at Madison Square Garden in New York. And we'll pick up the action in the first period. Rangers on the power play, Mark Messier moving down the wing, slides a perfect pass to Mike Gartner and historic goal. He's 500th NHL goal, and it's 1-0 New York. Later in the first period, 2-0 Rangers. This time, the Capitals are on the power play. Hunter to Dimitri Kristich. Kristich makes no mistake. Caps trail by a goal. Washington would tie it up. Mikhail Pavonka in front to Peter Bondra. He will beat Mike Richter, and the game is tied at two apiece. But New York would answer right back. Mark Messier, the captain, intercepts Dino Cicerelli's pass. Feeds to Tony Amante. Amante scores Rangers in front 3-2. The Capitals tied it up early in the third. Then a few minutes later, they went ahead. Kevin Hatcher unloads the big blast. 4-3 Washington. Mike Ridley, the former University of Manitoba star, added an empty net goal for Washington, making the final 5-3. It was Kristich, Bondra with the pair, Hatcher and Ridley for Washington. Gartner, Leach, and Amante scoring for the Rangers. The Capitals record now 5-1-0. They are off to a great start. 
Glenn Sather has made some big trades, in fact, some of the biggest trades in hockey history, and for the most part, all of them have come in the last three years. First, Wayne Gretzky to the Kings in 1988, the latest, Mark Messier to the Rangers two weeks ago. In the Messier deal, Sather got veteran Bernie Nichols along with youngsters Stephen Rice and Louis DeBrusque. Ken Chilebeck has an update. Young faces are the predominant feature of the Oilers now, and right winger Stephen Rice and left winger Louis DeBrusque are a couple of the newest, both 20 years of age, and both coming to the Oilers in what some people say the second biggest trade in Oilers history. It was a big throw just, just to be uh, mentioned in the same name or in the same sentence as Mark Messier. Getting traded for a guy like Mark Messier, being involved in a trade with Mark, involving Mark Messier is a great feeling because he's a great hockey player. He's been around for a long time. Rice is recovering from a separated shoulder, but he's being called a great team player. Maybe an indication of that is the fact that he captained Canada's juniors to the gold medal this past winter at the World Championships. I think it's one of the main reasons why Edmonton was, uh, you know, was, was uh, tried to acquire me. A little heavy. So I'm going to have to work on him. But he's a good kid. He's a character kid. He's a leader type person. Skates very well. He's got a great shot. Uh, I'm looking forward to working with him. DeBrusque's reputation is somewhat different. Statistics point that out. He had 223 minutes in penalties last year playing with London in the OHA. That reputation apparently though has made him a valuable acquisition for the Oilers. He's the kind of player that we were looking for. And he was a big part of this deal. The Rangers were very reluctant to, to trade him. That's what I do, you know, I go out there and bang in the corners and a lot of guys don't like to be hit, so you just turned out to be in a fight. They're young players with a lot of potential. That's probably the best way to describe Rice and DeBrusque right now. You probably won't hear about them on a daily basis, but the Oilers expecting them to be part of their future, whatever that'll be. Ken Chilobek, TSN, in Edmonton. When Cliff Fletcher took over the Toronto Maple Leafs, he had a long-term plan in mind, but one thing he had to do quickly was to find a goalie. So Cliff Fletcher went out and got one of the best... Grant Fewer. Many have questioned whether Fletcher gave up too much youth, but one thing is certain, Fewer seems to be genuinely happy to be in Toronto. With more, here is Vic Rauder. McPhee, good play. Cardinal speeding in on Fewer. Fewer beat him. Welcome to Toronto, Grant Fewer. Through his first four games, Fewer has faced an average of some 40 shots. The feeling is... Fewer still could be the difference between 10 wins or losses for the Leafs this season. 20 points in this league right now could be the difference between finishing second and finishing fifth. So, I mean, if I can do my part and get us, we'd like to finish first, obviously, but, I mean, if we finish second or third, make the playoffs, and then take a run at it from there, I think I'd be very happy with the way this year's going. Los Angeles, Detroit, New Jersey, they were also rumored to be interested in Fewer, so ultimately ending up in Toronto still is a bit of a surprise for him. On a whole, I don't think it's that bad. I mean, I enjoy being in Canada. And as it seems, everybody seems to be going to the States for tax breaks and that now, where yeah, it's hopefully someday we'll get some breaks here. But I mean, Canada's a good place to play, and Toronto's got a lot of d tradition behind it. So it's, I think it's going to be a good spot to be. Now, if Fewer feels any sadness at leaving Edmonton, it's because, like Coffey and Gretzky and Curry before him, now Messier and Anderson, it's the end of an era. Yet Fuhrer agrees it had to be done. Glenn's a very good businessman. I mean, I mean, as much as we're friends and such, business still comes first. And in a business sense, I think for the Oilers' sake, it's good moves. I mean, their average age now is going to be 21, 22 years old. And you can see where they're rebuilding. Whereas I come here now, and I'll have a chance to play here for hopefully the rest of my career. And I think we're going to do some good things here. So there's an obvious feeling with the arrival of Fuhrer, no longer can opposing teams take the Leafs for granted. Back to Cote, shooting and a glove save made by Grant Fuhrer's right hand. Okay, time for a quick break on sports desk. Still to come, one Thanksgiving Day game in the Canadian Football League. The Saskatchewan. The following is a Mall Star Communications production in association with ITV. The road's been rough for the Edmonton Oilers so far this season. Three games and three losses when playing away from the friendly fans at Northlands Coliseum. The worst loss was that first loss in Calgary, but there's no cause for concern. It's much too early. And remember last year, only two wins in 15 starts when the season began. The Oilers in October can be very deceiving. 
They were certainly ready to roll in the Smy semifinal. The favored Flames fell in a seven-game series. Then they got by Gretzky and the Los Angeles Kings to win the division championship. Another upset for the underdog. They were still on the ice in the month of May, reaching hockey's version of the Final Four. A pretty good season by any standard. And tonight, they're in Detroit looking for their first victory as visitors. The Edmonton Oilers meet the Detroit Red Wings live on ITV. The Oilers on ITV. Tonight's telecast is brought to you by Molson Canadian. What beer's all about? Good evening and welcome to our telecast from Joe Lewis Arena in downtown Detroit. I'm Tim Spellacy. Well, the Oilers are rolling into the Motor City after picking up their first win of the regular season Saturday night at Northlands Coliseum. The Red Wings are now the only team in the National Hockey League without a victory so far this season, and the Oilers would like to keep things that way, but perhaps Detroit is due to pull one out. The Oilers are also kicking off a four-game Eastern excursion. After tonight, they'll be heading to Chicago to face the Blackhawks on Thursday. They'll spend the weekend in New York to face the Islanders on Saturday. Then it's Marc Messier and the New York Rangers on Sunday. Not an easy road trip, but a win tonight would make the ride much more comfortable. With more on this matchup, here's our color commentator, Harry Neal, and he's standing by with Bruce Buchanan. Bruce? Thanks, Tim, and good evening, everybody. We welcome Harry Neal back to the Oilers on ITV. Well, it's nice to be back, Bruce, and I'm looking forward to tonight's game. The Oilers coming off a big win Saturday over the Calgary Flames, and Coach Ted Green, Harry, said one of the main reasons was improved play in their own end. Well, I don't think it's any uh, question that the Oilers are not going to win nearly as many games as they used to by outscoring the opposition. And if they're going to have a successful season, play without the puck in their own zone means more now than ever before that I can recall for the Oilers. Forward Anatoly Semenov came off the injured list and gave the Oilers a real spark. Well, I really like the way he played in the playoffs last year, and I think once he gets uh, back in game shape, he's going to do some scoring for the Oilers. Uh, I wonder if they're going to play him at center ice before long. These two clubs share a common problem. They're having trouble scoring goals. Uh, maybe with the Oilers, that's understandable, but not with the Red Wings. Yeah, that's very hard to believe with Iserman and Karsten and Fedorov, but the Wings are in a real slump as far as goals four is concerned, and they're worried about their goaltending, but they're not going to win averaging 2.75 goals a game in this league. And speaking of Iserman, he's off to a slow start. The slowest start since 1986-87. I'm sure he'll come around. And there's all kinds of talk here in Detroit about the possibility of Steve Iserman being traded. Three years ago, that would have been a sacrilegious thought here in the Motor City. Iserman and the Red Wings, Semenov and the Oilers coming up. Our telecast from the Joe Louis Arena in Detroit continues in just a moment. out of town scoreboard brought to you by your local bottler of coca-cola classic three other games around the nhl on a tuesday night a patrick division matchup pittsburgh and the new york islanders they're scoreless both teams with one loss each the toronto maple leafs have yet to win a road on the uh, game uh, game on the road so far this season that game gets underway in about one hour and the minnesota north stars are in calgary to face the flames that game begins in a couple of hours. The North Stars, three wins, no losses, and no ties so far this season. The Flames have lost three of their last four. We should note, though, all four of those games were played on the road. Well, as far as the injury situation is concerned, nothing to report from the Oilers' dressing room. Therefore, we expect to see the same lineup that we saw on Saturday night at Northlands Coliseum when the Oilers beat the Calgary Flames. As far as the Red Wings are concerned, a couple of significant changes. First of all, Troy Crowder, he's out with a back injury, the free agent acquired from the New Jersey Devils in early September. He'll be out about three weeks, and also out for three weeks, rookie Martin LaPointe with a fractured wrist. Good news, though, as far as the Red Wings lineup is concerned, defenseman Steve Chason is returning after sitting out a four-game suspension. He was suspended for hitching, hitting Rich Sutter in the back during the playoffs 
last spring. As we mentioned, the owners on the road for the next four games beginning tonight. They're back home at Northlands Coliseum for a couple of games. One week from tomorrow, they'll host the Washington Capitals. And two weeks from tomorrow, our next order's telecast here on ITV. It's the orders in Brett Hole and the St. Louis Blues. That's Wednesday, October 30th. Meanwhile, the Detroit Red Wings next to the action on Thursday night as they host the Blues here at Joe Louis Arena. Now, back to Bruce Buchanan and Harry Neal. Thanks, Tim. And once again, good evening, everybody. The Oilers beginning a four-game road trip at sold-out Joe Louis Arena in Detroit. The Red Wings, the only team in the NHL without a victory. The Oilers picking up their first win of the season Saturday night against the Calgary Flames. The referee tonight is 36-year-old Paul Stewart working his fourth season in the NHL. His linesman, Brian Murphy, and Ray Scapanello. 24-year-old Bill Ranford gets the call for the Oilers. His 201st NHL game tonight. Picked up his first win Saturday against Calgary with 21 saves. The Red Wings have been struggling in goal. 23-year-old Tim Shevelday makes his fifth start. He had 30 wins last season. That was third in the NHL. All kinds of talk about Shevelday being or the Red Wings acquiring a goalie to either challenge Shevel Day or replace him or urge him to on to better play. Brian Murray hasn't seemed to have been able to pull the trigger on that deal that he's been trying since early in the summer. First parade is underway. Muni gets it to Semenov in the corner. Out in front of his own net to Muni, and he carries it out for the orders. Pass it center to Mark Lamb, and he backhands it in. Swept to the board by Shevel Day. Kevin Lowe charges in for the point. A shot got between the pads of Shevel Day and through the crease. Here comes top Bob Probert for Detroit. He's with Iserman and Kevin Miller. Miller at the point, in front for Iserman. Luke. Me. He gets the draw right away here. And a shot from the top of the circle that Shevel Day saw all the way and made a pretty easy stop on him. One thing I like about Mellonby here, he gets a chance to shoot the puck and he'll... Penalty coming up. The Edmonton Journal. Tonight's first star from the Edmonton Oilers, number 30, Bill Renford. Tonight's second star from the Los Angeles Kings, number 32, Kelly Rudy. The Molson Cup first appeared in the 1972-73 season when Ronald Corey, then promotions coordinator at Molson Breweries, adopted an extension of the Imperial Oil Three Stars, a tradition that originated in Eastern Canada in the mid-1930s. The initial cup winner in 1973 was Montreal's Hall of Fame netminder, Ken Dryden. The following season, the promotion expanded to Toronto, and Borea Salming won his first of four Molson Cups. In 1976-77, the expansion Vancouver Canucks had their first winner in Bobby Milan. And 1979-80 saw number 99 win his first of a record-setting nine Molson Cups. That season, Morris Lukowicz continued the Molson Cup tradition in Winnipeg. And one season later, the initial cup winner was named in Calgary, the Magic Man, Kent Nielsen. Last year, the Molson Cup's 20th season, six of the game's brightest stars were honored. Montreal's new speedster, Russ Cordnell, won for the Canadians. Peter Ng, now a member of the Edmonton Oilers, was named the overall winner in Toronto. The Vancouver Canucks Molson Cup for 1991 went to Trevor Linden. While in Edmonton, the goaltending was great, and Bill Ranford won for the Oilers. And yet a third goaltender, Bob Essensa, was the winner in Winnipeg. While in the city of Calgary, the Flames' Theron Fleury took the cup with 110 overall points. With five points awarded for each game star selection, the overall winner is a reflection of the excellence of the entire season. And Molson Breweries is proud to recognize that excellence in Edmonton. And of course, we'll have the Molson Cup three stars coming up at the end of tonight's telecast. Coming up next, the out-of-town scoreboard. And our intermission continues in just a moment. Take the Olive Garden Pasta Tour. In the guard, however, the difference starts with an exclusive 300-point condition check. 
and ends with the news that your fully warranted service will cost exactly what they said it would. CertiGuard, personal car care you can count on from people you can trust. From Petro-Canada, committed to Canadians. And now tonight's Out of Town Scoreboard, brought to you by your local bottler of Coca-Cola Classic. Can't beat the feeling. Bit of a surprise on Long Island. The Islanders were just leading this game 6-3, but word in, it's now a 6-6 hockey game. Yager has scored a goal for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Mario Lemieux with his first hat-trick of the season. As we mentioned earlier, Derek King with a hat-trick for the Islanders. Lauer, Volek, and Wood have the other New York Islander goals. In St. Louis, Gino Cavallini has scored for the Blues. They now lead the Leafs by one. The Leafs, like the Oilers, with no wins so far this season on the road. And in Calgary tonight, the North Stars are going for their fourth win of the season. No losses, no ties. They lead the Flames 1-0. The Flames struggling a bit. They've lost three of their last four, but not struggling as much as the Edmonton Oilers, who have now lost four road games in a row, all of those on the road. The Red Wings get their first win of the regular season, and it's not going to get any easier for the Edmonton Oilers. Three games ahead, all on the road. They're in Chicago on Thursday, in New York on the weekend to face the Islanders Saturday. Mark Messier and the New York Islanders on the menu for Sunday for the Edmonton Oilers. Looking ahead to our next telecast here on ITV, it is two weeks from tomorrow, Wednesday, October 30th, as the St. Louis Blues drop by Northlands Coliseum. That's a 7.30 start, Wednesday, October 30th, the Oilers and the Blues. Once again, the final night, 3-1 Red Wings. Good night from Joe Louis Arena. The Oilers on ITV. Tonight's telecast has been brought to you by Molson Canadian. What beer's all about. The executive producer of the Oilers on ITV is Ron Harrison. Tonight's telecast from Joe Louis Arena in Detroit was produced by Ed Milliken. And it was directed by Jim Huff. Our technical producer, Phil LaPlante. A special thanks to the rest of the crew. A reminder, we'll see you again Wednesday, October 30th, as the Oilers take on the Blues at Northlands Coliseum. on the road. Nothing has been easy. Edmonton looking for its first win away from home on Long Island tonight. And early on in this one, the Islanders get some great chances. An Oiler goaltender Bill Ranford all over them, but uh, he kept that one out. Then Martin Jelena sweeps the puck in front as he's hauled down. Scott Melendy sweeps at it. He scores the Oilers' first goal. one nothing. Edmonton in the first. Oilers scramble to get the puck in the slot here. It comes to Joseph Baranek who fires it through Fitzpatrick's legs. And it is 2-0 Edmondson, also in the first. A little while later, though, Tikkanen gives the puck away to Joe Ricci. He sends Ray Ferraro all the way on a breakaway. He deeks Ranford, tucks it under his arm, get the Islanders back in it. It was 2-1 Edmondson. Islanders went on the power play. Sutter sends it to David Volek. He draws Ranford to him, backhands it to Derek King, who fires it in the wide open net. And King is off to a hot start this year for the Islanders. Now Martin Jelena cuts in, tries to get it there. Now he pulls it back. Look at all the room he's got and the time. And he can't put it in as he gets the puck in front. Now Jeff Bukaboom's point shot. Deflected in front by Scott Melendy. Gets through Fitzpatrick's legs. The Oilers went ahead 3-2. to Fitzpatrick went to the bench for the Islanders for the extra man for New York. Now you're going to hate this. If you've got Tekin in your draft, look at that. He gives it to McTavish. If you have McTavish, he gives it to Buckberger for the open net goal. And the final was the Edmonton Oilers 4-2 to over the New York Islanders. As I mentioned earlier, that is the first win on the road for Edmonton this year. Only their second win of the season. In the game many of us saw on Hockey Night in Canada tonight, the Calgary Flames found out the Vancouver Canucks are for real. The Canucks lead the Smythe Division and, in fact, share the league lead at this early stage of the season. And early is the key word when we talk about the Canucks bandwagon. But in this one, it was the Flames who were hot early. McLean makes the save on Suter here. McLean was sharp in the early going, but the Flames in the power play. Suter here fakes the shot, then fires it, goes through the slot, and it's Gilmore getting the rebound to make it one to nothing as Otto had the chance in front. 
But then Jeff Cortnall goes on the breakaway. Vernon, the nice save there. The Canucks then go all over the place. They're firing the puck from every angle. You'll notice the Flames aren't taking guys down, something they should have been doing all night. And it came back to, uh, to haunt them. Sergio Mameso gets the shot there. Flip Ronnie follows up to make it a 1-1 tie. Then Ryan Walter feeds Yerfi Lume coming through the middle. He fights off a check, fires the Canucks' second goal. It was 2-1 Vancouver. Now the Canucks on the power play. They throw it around. Vernon makes the first save here, but Greg Adams reaches around the defenseman to sweep the rebound in. Once again, the Flames not taking down the man around the net. Now Rick Nactris carries the puck over the blue line, deals the rolling puck to Tim Hunter. His blast beats McLean. That cut the lead to 3-2, but the Canucks kept on going. Should have been icing there, but Gary Roberts gets a chance. McLean makes the save. Now it comes to Geno Ojic, and Ojic breaks in alone. McKenna slashes him, but he gets the shot away. Vernon makes the save, and they call for a penalty shot because of the slash from McInnes. Now, Gino comes in, comes in on Vernon, a rolling puck, but he fires it in, and Gino Ojek, the crowd goes wild. They love Gino in Vancouver. Canucks led 4-2. to The Flames try to break out. Lidster intercepts the puck, fires from the point. Trevor Linden there for the rebound. 5-2 to two for Vancouver, and that would be the final. Trevor Linden, every time he scores, Vancouver wins, and they won again tonight the final 5-2, to and there are the goal scorers in this one tonight. Well, we have a lot more hockey to come tonight, including the Leafs, without Grand Fuhrer, getting battered by the Jets in Winnipeg. The average driver puts 19 to 21,000 kilometers each. More teams in the Smite Division in action tonight out on the coast. The Kings home to the North Stars and L.A. coming away with the victory in a game that was just over 5-2 Los Angeles won. And I tell you, some of those Kings are scoring well. Kedelski, Curry, and Robitaille all have five goals so far this season. In the other game on the coast, Boston beating San Jose by a score of 4-1. No goal scorers in on that one as of yet. Grant Fuhr was on the sidelines for the Toronto Maple Leafs tonight as they visited Winnipeg. Fuhr injured his thumb this morning in the pregame skate. So Jeff Reese got the call for Toronto. And in this one, goaltending was not a big factor. In the first period, the Leafs on the power play, five on three, point shot deflected by Glenn Anderson, his first goal as a Leaf. But the Jets tie it up on their power play. Russ Romanek beside the net here, fires it in his first NHL goal, and it was tied 1-1. Jeff Reese, in fact, played fairly well for Toronto. Here he robs Housley. All in alone here at the side, and with the glove save along the ice. Should have got it up in the air. In the second period, Danton Cole scoring for Winnipeg. He would make it 2-1. to one. That one threw a little bit of traffic, deflected in front. And then Dean Kennedy from the point will make it 3-1 to one, Winnipeg as he gets another one through a crowd that Reese didn't seem to have much chance for. 4-1, the Jets led in the third period when Toronto came back. Alexander Gudniuk scoring for Toronto, cut the lead to 4-2. to two. And that would be the final. Toronto wouldn't get any closer. Roman Cole, Kennedy, and Newman in scoring for Winnipeg in that one. In Quebec, the crowds are down, the team is down, morale is down there too, and Motown was in town for a Saturday night matchup. As we go to the action in this one, it was a big game for the Quebec Nordiques, and, uh, but it was Detroit who came out hot. Eisman had a pair of goals in this one, so did Shepard, and uh, Detroit is starting to really roll for uh, the De Motown team. Uh, Quebec, on the other hand, is in big, big trouble. And they saw Detroit pretty well scoring at will. Then later in the game, Smith for Quebec took a poke at some of the Detroit Red Wing players, and he got the right hand in there. Later, his coach Dave Chambers said, well, at least he cared. Can't say that about all the Quebec Nordiques as they go down 6-1 to one at home to Detroit. Montreal Canadiens handed Roly Melanson his first NHL start in three years as they went into the spectrum in Philadelphia against the Flyers tonight. A battle of first and last in their respective divisions with the Habs on top in the Adams and the Flyers at the bottom of the Patrick. Not much scoring in this one. Brent Gilchrist got the first goal of the game. Gilchrist going off his foot. They go to the replay, and yes, he does get credit for the goal. A little while later, it is a fight. Kordic and Odelin, and this one went on for quite a while. The left started going, and then Kordic got his right hand going. And, uh, well, he pretty well got to call it a draw. Woodland took the early part. Kordick came back and won the last part of that one. 
That was the most exciting part of the second period. In the third, Brad Jones goes in on Roly Melanson. He doesn't even have to make much of a save. In fact, Melanson only had to make 22 saves in this game. He got the shutout over Philadelphia. Gilchrist's goal stood up as the winner for the Habs in a 1-0 victory. In St. Louis, Chicago and the Blues play to a 4-4 tie. Shanahan with a pair of goals for the Blues, and he is playing fairly well as the new free agent acquisition for St. Louis. Washington Capitals off to their best start in the history of the franchise. Seven and one so far after a win over New Jersey tonight. The Devils, on the other hand, have lost four in a row after opening with four straight wins. And things didn't look promising just after the first minute of the game. Cicerelli picks off this pass, gives it to Chris Ditch, who makes the nice move to score. one nothing Caps at a minute eight into the game. Now a beautiful goal by Claude Lemieux, who goes around Langway, and then will Deke Rivnak put it in the net, a 1-1 tie at that point. Beautiful goal by Lemieux. Then it is Drews with a three-way passing play. Pavanka to Bondra, back to Pavanka to Drews. He puts it in the open side. The Caps went ahead 2-1. Now the Caps storm the Devils' net. Miller will get a chance at the side here. He can't put it in. Then Ridley will get the rebound. He can't put it in. And Lawler comes up, picks up the garbage, and puts it in the open net. The Caps were ahead 3-1. Now a two-on-one, -on -one, Krieger and Kristich. Kristich takes it, his second at a rocket to the top corner, his second of the game with 17 seconds to go in the second period. Another Devils giveaway here to Krieger. He puts it in front to Rid Ridley, and look at that. Nobody's touching him. He gets three chances, scores the Caps' fifth goal. A little while later, it's Lemieux up to his old tricks. The high stick at the side of the boards there, and a uh, little blood and things spilled over to a couple of fights, and here was the main event, Danico and Greenlaw. Left, 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 left. I'm talking lefts here, folks, and that's the way things ended up in New Jersey. Washington holding on for the victory, 5-1. to one. Christich had a pair of goals for the Capitals in that one. The New York Rangers visited Pittsburgh tonight as the Penguins raised the Stanley Cup banner, but the ceremony seemed to inspire the visitors rather than the defending champs. Yes, three banners went up in Pittsburgh, the division, conference, and Stanley Cup champs. But as Paul Broughton shorthanded for the Rangers here, he made it 2-1 New York early on. And then the Rangers went ahead 3-0. John Agrodnik is stopped, but Sergei Nemchinov scores on the rebound. He had two goals on the night. It was 3-0. But they would tie it up 4-4. Mario Lemieux had a pair of assists in this one, but he left the game with back spasms. And with 1-10 to go, it's Darren Turcott who will put the Rangers ahead. Picks up the garbage there beside it, and the Rangers go on to a 5-4 victory over Pittsburgh. And the Rangers are coming out pretty quick this year as well. In Hartford, Pat Verbeek had a pair of goals as he celebrates his new contract. Hartford beating Buffalo 4-1, and the Sabres are not looking too good. Taking a look at the minors, the Edmonton Oilers uh, minor league team, the Cape Breton Oilers losing 5-3 to, to Halifax. Dan Curry had a pair of goals. Steven You're jealous. Jealous of who? It. Don't touch me. You guys, come on! Talk to Tyler, please, please, I'm alone! Exactly what kind of a relationship do you have with him? Let's just pretend that this whole day never happened. But why? I don't understand. I'm HIV positive. What? Becca, I'm going to get AIDS. Joe Murphy scored the tying goal and set up the winner as the Oilers stunned the Rangers 4 3. Bruce Buchanan has the highlights. Essa Tikkanen carries the puck deep into Ranger territory, leaves it for Semenov, who feeds Vince Donfus for his first goal as an order, 1-0. Rangers get even on a power play. Mark Messier moves into the slot and beats Bill Ranford to the stick side, 1-1. With New York leading 2-1, Kelly Bookberger fights off a check to cash in Josef Berenik's rebound, Bookberger's third goal, game tied 2-2. Rangers led 3-2 after two, but orders rally in the third with two late goals. Joe Murphy gets his stick on Luke Richardson's point shot, and it's 3-3. 43 seconds later, Oilers pressuring. Murphy in front to Craig Simpson. Oilers win their second straight, surprising the Rangers 4-3.
We haven't been getting uh, a lot of breaks, but uh, you know we've been putting the puck on the net more, and that's what happened. And you know the, the puck just happened to hit my stick. It was a lucky bounce, and uh, and it went in the net and changed the direction of the game. And then we came back and scored again right away. And that you know it's just, just the breaks we were looking for, and uh, you know to get get things on a roll. It showed how far this team has come in the last uh, week to ten days. Uh, after the start we had, we know we had some work to do, and we had to gel as a team. And I think we proved some of that uh, over the weekend. I'm just glad that he's he's not in our division. I don't think I could play against him. Uh, seven or eight times a season and uh, it, it was really hard and you know I just hope I don't have to go through it too, too, uh, too many more times. There's only one game in the NHL tonight. It takes place in Vancouver where the Canucks host the Toronto Maple Leafs. Hockey is alive and well in Vancouver as the club is off to a great start. Toronto on the other hand has been struggling. Only constant for the team has been the goaltending. Grant Fuhrer has been Mr. Reliable in the pipes. But Fuhrer missed the team's flight out west yesterday. Club had no idea where he was. He eventually did arrive and had this explanation. I had some family problems that I had to deal with and I felt they were very important. When they weren't in Winnipeg, they were elsewhere. Actually, no, I was in Winnipeg. We had some friends of the family, and that's where I dealt with them from. It was just a mistake on my part not to let the team know. Oh, okay, so you hadn't informed the team as to why you weren't there. Not at that time. Late in the evening, I did. But, I mean, I felt the problems had to be dealt with. And was that uh, satisfactory with the coach and everything's okay? I talked to Tom last night, and everything seems to be fine. Ben Johnson has pleaded guilty to assaulting former teammate Cheryl Thibodeau. Toronto Sprinter was charged last December after Thibodeau accused him of pushing and grabbing her by the throat. Johnson has received a conditional discharge and has been placed on 60 months probation. He must also perform 75 hours of community service work. Plenty of other highlights from the past weekend in sports, including the World Series. Twins took both weekend... take on the Washington Capitals over at the Coliseum on Wednesday night. The club got home today after that up and down road trip that started rather dismal, but it ended with a very productive weekend. Lisa Miller has more. This controversial goal by Joe Murphy last night in Manhattan gave the Oilers their second consecutive road win and made today's long trip home far more enjoyable. When you win hockey games and that, that you, uh, you know, you, you build some confidence as a team and think you can win and that's, that's just what we did. Peter Klima preceded the team home. Once again, it's decision time. We've won, our, we've won three games this year, and we won all three games without Peter Klima in the lineup. Anything to do with Peter will be done tomorrow. I haven't had a chance to talk to him, see him, and uh, I'd rather just go home and get a nice hot meal. It's purely a management situation as far as we're concerned. Uh, we uh, will allow Glenn and and uh, Peter to work out those things. Uh, you know, we've, we've got a good chemistry right now and whatever happens, happens. But, you know, we're coming off two solid wins and we'll sort of leave it at that. The Oilers had a tough travel schedule to start the season. Playing seven of their first nine games on the road hasn't helped this rebuilding club. The Oilers haven't lost at home yet this season, so the picture appears brighter with five of the next seven at the Coliseum. Lisa Miller, CFRN, Eyewitness Sports. Well, guess who's in the middle of another controversy? Grant Fuhrer, the former Oiler netminder. He missed the Toronto practice yesterday and the team flight to Vancouver for tonight's game against the Canucks. No one seemed to know exactly where Grant was, but he did show up in Vancouver this morning and explained what happened. Family problems that I had to deal with, and I felt they were very important. When they weren't in Winnipeg, they were elsewhere? Actually, no, I was in Winnipeg. We had some friends of the family, and that's where I dealt with them from. It was just a mistake on my part not to let the team know. Oh, okay, so you hadn't informed the team as to why you weren't there? Not at that time. Late in the evening, I did. But, I mean, I felt the problems had to be dealt with. And was that uh, satisfactory with the coach, and everything's okay? I talked to Tom last night, and everything seems to be fine. Well, Toronto coach Tom Watt refused to discuss Fewer's situation except to say today that Grant will be fined. The Leafs, as I said, play in Vancouver tonight. When I return in a few minutes' time with our other segment of sports, we're going to be looking at that very controversial play at first base in the World Series yesterday and also the... Successful hockey wasn't enough to give the Oilers the win. After a great first period in which the team looked solid, they were reeled in by the NHL's top club as Washington stormed back to win by a final of 6-5. Bruce has the highlights. 
Orders came out flying and connected three and a half minutes in. Joe Murphy fires a slap shot past Jim Ribnack. One nothing orders. Five minutes later, Dave Batson hits Kelly Buckberger with a good cross ice pass. He heads for the net and makes a great move. Two nothing. Buckberger wasn't finished. He unloads a screenshot from the top of the circle for his fifth goal of the season. Oilers led 3-0 after one. Oilers padded their lead early in the second. Bill Ranford races out of his net and pokes the puck ahead to Yosef Baranek. Baranek on a breakaway beats Mike Liu to replace Ribnak. Oilers seemingly in control. It was 4-0. Capitals closed the gap to 4-3 at the end of two and tied the game two minutes into the third. Dale Hunter getting credit for the goal. Caps take their first lead six minutes after that. Oilers give the puck away, and Dino Cicerelli is waiting in the slot, his second of the night, 5-4 Washington. Oilers bounce back, pulling even on a power play. Essatikinen's low drive from the point finds the corner. Score tied 5-5. Capitals are given a late power play and take advantage. Randy Burridge sets up Dimitri Kristic, who was all alone at the side of the goal. Washington overcomes a 4-0 deficit to stun the Oilers 6-5. We wanted to come back after uh, having a bad period, just regroup and get back to doing the things that, you know, has made us successful. And uh, we got a couple breaks and, uh, you know, we knew we were close and we just kept plugging away. We're disappointed in the loss, obviously. We, we had such a great first period. We accumulated a lead. Uh, we scored six goals when we had trouble scoring goals in the past. I'm disappointed the way the game ended, but at the same time, uh, we can build off this game. And a trade made in the NHL today. Calgary Flames sent veteran winger Colin Patterson to the Buffalo Sabres for future considerations. Patterson missed all of last season with a knee injury, you may remember, and he's yet to play yet this year. Well, although Major League offices may have been shivering a bit when the World Series began between the Twins and the Braves, Dave Thomas from Chicago. Now to get the players, the Islanders gave away reluctant center Pat LaFontaine, winger Randy Wood, and rear guard Randy Hillier, plus a draft choice to Buffalo, and they sent center Brent Sutter and winger Brad Lauer over to the Blackhawks. Now, the flashy LaFontaine was obviously the key player for the Buffalo Sabres. He has averaged more than 90 points a season during eight years with the Islanders, but the Sabres feel he'll contribute in other ways. He's a, a great skater, a great goal scorer, a leader, a community asset, uh, well thought of uh, by everybody off ice and on, a solid citizen in both directions, and on the ice, he's been really the reason for the most part, he and Brent Sutter, I suppose, for the Islanders remaining uh, competitive from year to year over the last four or five years as they rebuilt. Well, for the Islanders, the key player is young Pierre Turgeon, who was the offensive leader for four years with Buffalo, but the Islanders were trying to fill a number of holes today. We have addressed our future in that the players we are getting obviously are basically younger and have a longer future ahead of them. I think we have gained in some size and hopefully we have balanced our, our team out in some areas that we felt needed to be addressed. And there are still lots of good tickets left for tomorrow's Oiler game over at the Coliseum. It's the first of a home-and-home -home weekend against the top team in the NHL, the Vancouver Canucks. Winger Peter Klima, who has only played in four games this season, skated on a line with Vince Damfus and Anatoly Semenov this morning at practice. He'll be back in uniform for the Oilers tomorrow night. Peter skated well in practice this morning, looked good with his line, and uh, yes, he'll be in the lineup this weekend. It's going to be a lot of pressure, but, uh, you know, uh, I got a lot of confidence in me and uh, the team, and uh, hopefully uh, everything's going to go all right. In other NHL news today, uh, concerned to hold out center Ron Francis. He's now settled his contract dispute with Pittsburgh. The terms to a multi-year deal were not disclosed, but Francis, who hasn't played this season, is expected to rejoin the team for tomorrow night's game in Montreal. And it's official now. Big Eric Lindros will join our Canadian Olympic team for the Albertville Games in February. Lindros will play about 25 games with Dave King's squad in the next three months prior to the Olympics, and King feels that the Lindros edition will help Canada win a medal at the games and let's hope so we'll be talking about baseball the world series and also football and other sports when we return in a few minutes time daryl all right thank you al rather than standard payload of any half ton truck sold in canada does your truck have the most available horsepower of any truck on the road today does your truck have one of the best full coverage warranties in the business period is your truck a chevy truck 
The trucks you can depend on. The trucks that last. CBC Sports is proud to present Molson Hockey Night in Canada. Tonight from coast to coast in Canada, the Stanley Cup champions are at the Forum to play the Canadians. While at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto, the Leafs hope home ice advantage will help them beat their recent doldrums and the Detroit Red Wings. Also this evening, we have a camera at the Northlands Coliseum in Edmonton where the Oilers take on the NHL's overall leaders. Good evening and welcome to Molson Hockey Night in Canada on CBC and to the Gardens in Toronto. I'm Ron McLean. Yesterday, on the 23rd day of the NHL's new season, trade winds battered Long Island, leaving Pat LaFontaine and Brent Sutter and three teammates exiled. The Buffalo Sabres now have LaFontaine, Randy Wood, and Randy Hillier. Pat will play for Buffalo tomorrow against Hartford. Chicago Nets, Brent Sutter and Brad Lauer. And there's a new look in New York. Turgeon, McIlwain, Krupp, Hogue, Creighton, and Thomas all set to join the New York Islanders as a result of yesterday. This afternoon, one game in the NHL, Boston at the Met Center in Minnesota. The Stars strike early and often. This goal by Jim Johnson in the second period on Matt Del Judas makes it 3-0 Stars. John Casey was impeccable in goal. Here he beats Gary Galley. The Stars beat the Bruins on the eighth career shutout for Casey, the final 4-0. Great goalies have been part of the story for the Canucks and the Oilers this year. We'll have highlights of the game at Northlands Coliseum as Vancouver invades the Northlands Coliseum. At the Forum, the Pittsburgh Penguins are visitors. The way the Canadians have been shutting out opponents this year, you would think that Scotty Bowman's coaching in Montreal. And he is. Here's Scott Russell. Well, Ron, all that glitters is not just gold at the Forum tonight. It could be the diamond in a Stanley Cup ring like this. The Pittsburgh Penguins own about 30 of these Stanley Cup rings, and this one belongs to Scotty Bowman, who is the head coach of the Penguins. They got them Monday in an official ceremony in Pittsburgh. Scotty's uh, much of his success was here at the Montreal Forum with the Canadians. Eight seasons, five Stanley Cups, including four in a row from 76 to 79. This morning, he came back in into his old haunt to coach against his old team. He met some old friends and took time to speak to his old partner, Dick Urban. Scotty Bowman back behind the bench with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Coaching hockey against Scotty, I guess for you in this particular case, a bit of a case of mixed emotions. Very difficult, you know, Dick, but I, somebody had to do it from the Pittsburgh Penguins. and. Imagine if I wouldn't have uh, agreed to do it, Craig probably would have, you know, done it. I don't think a manager today really can afford the time. So, uh, and the way Bob treated everyone, I talked closely with Bob uh, Johnson and Martha, his wife, and they wanted it this way. And I feel that with his condition right now, whatever whatever he wants, we'll, we'll do. Behind the bench in the 90s compared to the 70s and the 80s for Scotty Bowman. Much of a difference. Well, even the 60s, they <laughs> didn't date me. I, I, I'll put it this way. I, if I tried to coach the way I did when I first started, I think every player would ask to be traded. Thanks, Scotty. Great to have you back on Hockey Night in Canada. I'll be a brief. Thank you. Back to Scott Russell. Indeed, nice to see Scotty Bowman back on Hockey Night in Canada. His Penguins play their 10th game of the season tonight. In it, Paul Coffey could set an NHL milestone. He has 310 goals tied with Islander great Denny Potvin for the all-time lead among defensemen. Number 311 would give Coffey the lead in every offensive category for NHL defensemen. Bad news for Pittsburgh. Mario Lemieux left last Saturday's game with the Rangers with hip pain. He hasn't skated since, and Lemieux did not make the trip to Montreal for the game tonight with the Montreal Canadiens. So, no Mario Lemieux. Ron Francis has signed a new contract. He will play against the Canadiens. Right now, back to Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto and Ron McLean. Thank you very much, Scott. That looks like a nice matchup for Toronto. They've been in tough, having lost seven in a row, five straight games on the road. They come home looking to avert falling below 500 all time. Last night, the Leafs started a home and home against Detroit at the Joe Louis Arena and they were outshot and outplayed badly. This is a shorthanded goal in the second period as Paul Isabart and Sergei Fedorov combined to beat Grant Fuhrer. That made it two zip for the Wings. They score two more and defeat Toronto 4-0. A combination shutout for Tim Shevelday and Vincent Riendo. Riendo started the game in goal, recently acquired from the Blues for Zombo. As he was watching Mike Krushelniski set up behind the goal, 
He somehow twisted his right knee. He apparently will be able to rejoin the Red Wings later on this week. So the Maple Leafs against Detroit here at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. We will have Paul Coffey on Inside Hockey tonight, and we'll have Don Cherry along in the coach's corner. But on this final Saturday of October, we have something a little special going away. We want to salute young Canadians who've put their birthplaces on the current edition of the NHL map. It's always something special when a rookie scores. Here's Toronto's Rob Pearson scoring his first NHL goal against Detroit in the second game of the season. That celebration tells you the feeling. Rob has three more. They'll always be happy in Hay River, Northwest Territories, when Jeff Sanderson of the Hartford Whalers pots a goal, and so will folks in St. Albert, Alberta, where he now lives. Jimmy Waits in goal for the Chicago Blackhawks a lot these days. He makes his home in Sherbrooke, and that's where he was born. In Saskatchewan, around Bertle and Fox Warren, all the Falloons have reason to rejoice as Pat continues his exploits with the San Jose Sharks. In Cambridge and in Port Elgin, Ontario, they're proud of Louis DeBrusque of the Edmonton Oilers. And another one who is making an impact in this young season is Pat McLeod, born in Melford, Saskatchewan. He plays for San Jose, and folks in Port Saskatchewan, Alberta, also have reason to rejoice whenever he scores. So tonight on Hockey Night in Canada, Pittsburgh is at the Forum in Montreal. That's the game seen nationally. Detroit's in Toronto for Southern Alberta, and Southern Ontario, rather. We'll also have highlights from Alberta. Molson Hockey Night in Canada on CBC is brought to you by Molson Canadian, what beer is all about. By Ford of Canada, where quality is more than a commitment, quality is job one. And by Esso Associates and Imperial Oil. You're on your way with Esso. There's one thing that makes a person attractive. It's not their hair. Their face. Or their clothes. It's their attitude. Molson Canadian. Tenth goal of the season as the Penguins beat the Jets. Former Oiler Paul Coffey also scoring with the highlights. Here's Darren Decision. The Jets and the Penguins from the arena in Winnipeg. And the Jets come out heading. Troy Murray will line up Mark Recchi and he hammers him to the ice. Now midway through the first period, the Penguins open up the scoring. Troy Loney will pick up the puck behind the net. He stuffs it in on the wraparound for his second goal of the season. One to nothing. Pens after one period. To the second period, and the Penguins go up by two. Paul Coffey will get the goal with Kevin Stevens supplying the screen. That was Coffey's fourth of the year. Before the end of the second, though, the Jets get on the board. They have the best power play in the NHL, and it works for them tonight. Housley lets a shot go from the point. Luciano Borsano's all over the rebound, 2-1 after two periods. In the third period, the Jets try and tie it up, but Tom Barrasso sharp here making the save off Stu Barnes and then stopping it up a Paul Fenton shot so that the puck will just trickle wide of the net. Now midway through the third period, the Penguins get another one. It's on the power play. Big Mario brings the puck out in front. His shot hits the skate and goes up over Tabarachi as the Penguins take a 3-1 to one lead. And the Jets' record now below 500. There remain only two points up on the orders in fourth place in the Smite Division. In other action, the Red Wings win by one. They're now tied for second in the Norris Division. The Buffalo Sabres, a one-goal victory in overtime over the Philadelphia Flyers. Only their fifth win of the season for the Buffalo Sabres. Donald O'Dick got the winning goal in that game. And the San Jose Sharks looking for their second win of the season. After 40 minutes, they lead the orders by a pair. And third period action from the Cow Palace is coming up next. You're watching the orders on ITV. Imagine. Well, right at the end of the game, Presley and Bookberger collided, had some words, jousted slightly, but the referee and linesman have got both teams separated, and the LA Shark or the San Jose Sharks win their second game here in the National League and fractured a 13-game losing streak, much to the delight of the fans. 
10,800 and a few more that joined us in this game at the Cow Palace. Sharks have two wins on the season as they gather around goaltender Archer Zerbe, winning his first NHL game. Both Shark victories have come against Smite Division clubs, first the Calgary Flames, and tonight against the Edmonton Oilers. And the fans are in a partying mood at the Cow Palace. The final score tonight, the Sharks six, and the Oilers two. In a moment, we will have the Molson Cup three-star selection. With a win in his first start in the National Hockey League, the second star from the Sharks, Paul Fenton with two goals tonight, and the third star also from San Jose, Neil Wilkinson, who set up three goals tonight. A look at the Molson Cup standings at Edmonton. Essa in the top spot. Baranek in second place. Four fires tied for third place in the Edmonton Molson Cup standings. And once again, tonight's final, the Sharks six, the orders two. Our Molson Hockey telecast continues in just a moment. When asked who offers a full range of real estate services, Cow Palace in Daly City. Now it's time to find out who's going on a trip for two to Disneyland in Safeway's score and win contest to make the draw. Let's go back to the studio. Here's Shelley. Thanks, Tim. Well, it's time for another Safeway score and win prize draw for a trip for two with Canadian holidays to Southern California's favorite destination, Disneyland. I'll just give it a mix up and we'll see who our winner is today. Looks like it is Sophie Keller who entered using an old Dutch potato chip label. Now remember to include a proof of purchase from the product of the week with every entry and enter often at participating Safeway and Food for Less stores. Tim? Thanks, Shelley, and our guest at this time, the gentleman who scored the winning goal, also had one assist tonight, Dean Evison of the San Jose Sharks. And Dean, tell us uh, what a win like this means to your hockey team. Well, it's, it's, it's tremendous boost for us, obviously. Uh, we've had some tough luck on the Second goal of the period. Look at the shots in the first period. 19 to 6. The Sharks out shooting the orders. Now in the second period, the orders came back a bit. An unassisted shorthanded goal by Craig McTavish. Looked like it might spark the orders. Did out shoot the Sharks 16 to 6, but Irvay was the difference in the second period. And then in the final period tonight, Presley and Pat Balloon scoring. 9 to 4. The orders out shooting the Sharks in the final period. 31-29. Over 60 minutes of play, but it doesn't matter. 6-2, the final score in favor of San Jose. And now a look at tonight's winning goal. It came in the first period when the Sharks quickly built up a 3-1 lead, and this was the last goal to be scored on Peter Ng, who was pulled in favor of Bill Ranford. Dean Everson, who we just spoke with, picking up a rebound past Peter Ng. His second goal of the season to give the Sharks a 3-1 lead, and they cruise to a 6-2 victory over the Everton Orders, their second victory of the regular season. A look now at the Smythe Division standings. The surprising Vancouver Canucks remain on top spot. The LA Kings who host the Orders tomorrow night in second. Calgary, Winnipeg. And then the Edmonton Orders in fifth place and right now out of playoff contention in the Smythe Division. And the San Jose Sharks will change that. They now have two wins and four points in the Smythe Division cellar. And we'll review tonight's NHL scoreboard. That's coming up next. Stay with us. We'll be right back from the Cow Palace. Well, the Kings have eight wins on the year. Some it's been a little disappointing. On paper, the talent can't be questioned, but on the ice, really hasn't been seen, at least not as often as people have expected. Let's go to Winnipeg, show you the highlights. Pick this one up early on. Jets, Dean Kennedy, weak shot from the point. It will beat Daniel Bertiome, and it is 1-0 Winnipeg. Then, only 30 seconds later, a little R&R &R in the form of Russ Romanuk, letting the shot go from the face-off circle, and it's 2-0 Winnipeg. And then, only minutes later again, it's more Jets. Housley will feed to Olchek. He will drop it back to Erickson. Olchek, how he meeker likes it, goes to the net, finds himself with a rebound in front, and it's 3-0, and that was it for Daniel Bertiomi. Gets the hook. Kelly Rudy comes in to replace him. Bob ascends in the nets for the Jets, looking very good, making the glove save off Thomas Sandstrom. Later in the first, the Kings will finally score. McIntyre to rookie Daryl Sador. Nice backhand pass over to Mike Donnelly, and it's 3-1. Let's go to the third period now. It's 3-2 Winnipeg. Stu Barnes. We'll make it a two-goal hockey game once again. This time, the snapshot, ah, ugly, very ugly. Kelly Rudy lets it go by him. It's 4-2. 
Then it's the door without the helmet, making the rookie mistake, giving the puck up. Shannon over to Barnes. He's got his second, and it's 5-2. Only 30 seconds left in the game. Jets trying to get the hat trick on the power play for the St. Albert native Stewie Barnes. And he is alone. He deflects it. It goes up high into the corner. This one was all Winnipeg at the arena. Final score, 6-2. Stu Barnes with his first career hat trick. Jets snap a six-game losing streak. They are now playing 500 hockey. Incidentally, Barnes is the first hat trick for a Jet player since 1989. Well, after a slow start to the season, Brett Hull appears to be back in the form that everyone expect, expects him to be in. St. Louis Blues forwards would named NHL Player of the Week. Hull scored eight goals in four games, now leads the league with 16. Hull edged out Randy Burge and Kirk McLean for the Player of the Week honors. And today was the final day for Major League players to file for free agency, and that's exactly what the most valuable player in last month's World Series did. Jack Morris has decided to test the free agent waters. That's all in our weekend wrap. After being involved in a shark feeding frenzy Friday night, Oilers bounce back Saturday at the Great Western Forum, only to see a three-goal lead slip away. Peter Ahola tied the game at four. That's how it ended, four all between the Oilers and Kings. Also Saturday, world figure skating champion Kurt Browning won the Lalique figure skating competition. The event was the only competition that will be held in Elbertville, France, before the Winter Olympics. Yesterday, the CFL semifinals were played, and Calgary, the Stampeders, were looking to end a 12-year playoff drought with the win at home against the Lions. Things did not go well early on. Doug Flutie in the Lions offense was in control of the first half of the ball game. Trailing by 16 with 30 minutes left, though, Danny Barrett and the Stampeders offense got rolling. That combined with a much improved defensive effort, and the Stampeders beat the Lions 43-41, to setting up a Calgary-Edmonton Western Final Sunday at Commonwealth. Out east, the outcome was never in doubt. The defending Grey Cup champion Winnipeg Blue Bombers rode their strong defense and the foot of Troy Westwood as they beat the Ottawa Rough Riders 26-8. Bombers traveled to Skydome to take on the Argos in the East final Sunday. In the NFL, the question remains, can anyone beat the Washington Red? Scoring three straight goals, this by Eddie Olchek, his 10th of the season. That gave Winnipeg a 3-0 lead in the first four minutes of the game. Edmonton product Daryl Sador, number 40, made a great play later in that first period, setting up Mike Donnelly. That made it 3-1 Jets after one. Winnipeg had the lead 3-2 when another Edmonton area product, Stu Barnes, went to work. He beat Daniel Berthume, and then Sador, without his helmet, will give the puck away. And that results in Barnes' a second goal of the game and made it a 5-2 contest for Winnipeg. Later on a power play in the third period, Stu Barnes deflects Phil Housley's point shot, his third goal of the game, his first NHL hat trick, and the Jets win it 6-2. Well, our Oilers are enjoying a spot of golf and rest in Palm Springs sunshine today. They hustled into the desert after their tie game against the Kings on Saturday night, but they'll be heading back east tomorrow to continue their six-game road trip. They'll play the Penguins in Pittsburgh Wednesday night. You know, although it may be hard to believe, when the Oilers play a home game at the Coliseum, there's nearly as much action off the ice as there is on. We took our cameras behind the scenes at last week's Oiler Islander game, and what we found out has turned into a five-part series that we call the Rink Rats. Alan Stafford has part one for us right now. On the surface, it doesn't look like there's much to this job. Just jump in the seat, put it in drive, and make sure water spills out onto the ice. Brian Steele is one of a half dozen Northland's employees who resurfaces the ice for the Oilers. He's been handling this chore for five years, and he says it's not as easy as it looks. You know, there's a lot to do. You have to turn your water on and off. You, you raise your blade to, to shave off whatever amount you want, and it uh, takes a while to master the pattern. It also takes a while to master a cranky Zamboni machine, as Brian discovered the very first time he resurfaced the ice for an Oilers game. I went onto the ice, and I took my first turn, and I was driving along the boards, and as I got into my first corner, the machine stalled on me. It just died. And, uh, you know, like I say, I was nervous enough as it was, and boy, luckily we got it started again, but I don't know what I would have done. But Brian isn't the only employee with a tough job at the Coliseum. For the last 11 years, this man has been keeping autograph hounds out of the Oiler dressing room. And dealing with overzealous fans requires a lot of diplomacy. Do you have uh, a hard time explaining that to them sometimes? So, no, to grunts. But, I mean, the normal people are very understanding. Because they understand why the barricades are there to start off with. The Edmonton Oilers! 
Join us tomorrow night for part two of Brinkrat. Corey Elliott will have a feature report on Oilers public address system announcer Mark Lewis. Alan Stafford, CFRN Eyewitness Sports. Well, there are four teams left in the hunt for the Grey Cup following yesterday's action. Wow, I can remember times when we used to. Thank you very much. When we used to uh, get uh, those cold remembrance days when you put on the park and the wind would still blow right through you. Well, there's that cloud cover for most of British Columbia and Alberta. This one, we'll talk about it right now. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Yet another familiar name has gone from the Edmonton Oilers. Veteran defenseman Jeff Bukaboom has been sent to the New York Rangers for David Shaw. Now, according to our sources, this is part of the Marc Messier deal. Apparently, Marc Messier told Bukaboom a couple of weeks ago that because of the cash that was involved in him going to New York, Oilers would have to give up either Luke Richardson or Bukaboom. Well, the six-foot-four Bukaboom began his career with the Oilers in 86-87. Struggled somewhat for a few years, but turned into one of the club's best defensemen, especially when he decided to use his size because he can hit with the best of them. Now, this is what the data looks like on Shaw. He is 27, a year older than Bukaboom, nine seasons in the league, has 24 goals, 94 assists in his career with 457 penalty minutes. Consider that he did play behind Brian Leach and James Patrick. Madison Square Garden announcer John Davidson gave us this profile of Shaw. Well, he's, uh, he's got size, not quite as big as Jeff Bukaboom, and um, age difference, he's one year older than is Jeff, uh, so the Rangers gain a little bit in both size and age, but not a huge amount. David, uh, for his size, isn't, isn't as aggressive, uh, yet he's not a very passive defenseman either. He'll, he'll try and take people out in front, and he'll work the corners. The uh, biggest thing that he did as a Ranger, probably two things, is uh, A, his first pass out of the zone is usually a quick and very accurate pass. I remember when Michelle Bergeron was here, and he was part of the coaching staff that, uh, that decided to trade for David Shaw from Quebec, where Bergeron coached him originally. He talked a lot at the time about his ability to move the puck out of the zone quickly, and that's something he's very good at. And the other thing is that he was the right defenseman for Brian Leach. Brian Leach is a left defenseman, and they complemented each other when, uh, when Brian went up ice quite a bit, and he does it uh, a lot. David Shaw was always the safety valve, always the guy staying back. Um, the Rangers, uh, however, in looking at this trade, uh, have improved their team because they have a, a much more aggressive defense. And we'll have more on the trade tonight on Sports Time. Winnipeg Jets have come up with a plan that may keep them in the city. Jets apparently have a deal that would see local and provincial governments cover any operating losses by the club until 1997. Sounds pretty good, of course, but it needs approval from both levels of government. And still with the business side of hockey, it appears the prospective owners of the Pittsburgh Penguins will go it alone in their bid to purchase the team. Talks between Baldwin and Bellsburg, potential investors have stopped. And the two are waiting for an official vote next week from the league. And two weeks ago, his brother was given the okay to play in the NHL. Today, Pavel Bury's brother, Valerie, has been given the chance to play junior hockey in North America. The 17-year-old may suit up tomorrow night for the defending Memorial Cup champion, Spokane Chiefs. To football, the Eskimos hit the practice field this afternoon once again after three days. David Shaw, another former first-rounder. It's a deal the Rangers have been looking for because they didn't have a big, rugged defenseman who could move people from in front of the net. Bukaboom fits that description, and the Oilers lose a physical force on the blue line with the trade. I think the only ones that will be celebrating in the streets will be uh, the players in Calgary and Vancouver and perhaps Los Angeles. So it just doesn't sound like a very good deal uh, as far as the orders are concerned. And uh, it's obviously tied in with the Marc Messier trade. And uh, this is the final end of it. Well, Rod's in Pittsburgh, and of course, uh, Jeff Bukaboom also told Rod that he was informed two weeks ago by Marc Messier, of all people, that he would likely be going to the Rangers to complete that trade. And uh, when that happened, the Oilers would receive $5 million. Now, we weren't able to confirm that with the Oilers because Peter Pocklington and Glenn Sather have not returned from Palm Springs, where the team just completed a two-day uh, rest break. Well, last night we started our five-part series on the people behind the scenes at Oiler Games. We call it the Rink Rats. And tonight we've got a look at our public address announcer, a former working mate here at CFRN, Mark Lewis. Hi. How are you? Not sad. How are you? Bad. Good. Good-looking team? Yeah, not bad. 
coming around. Mark Lewis begins his work day at the Coliseum here outside the visitor's dressing room where he goes through the lineup with the head coach for the scratches and additions. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, and 2. Very good. Good luck. Okay. See you, you later. Okay. There's their lineup right there. Now I want to see the... Mark's next stop is the Oilers dressing room where Coach Ted Green checks the visitors lineup then goes over his own. Terry's in the center. Now I got to make some changes here, okay? Okay. When Mark's finished in the Oilers dressing room getting the lineup, it's back upstairs where he'll wait till the opening of the hockey game and his most famous words. How you doing? Hey, that's stuff. Mark took over as the Oilers PA announcer just before the Canada Cup in 1981. He wasn't beyond stretching the truth a little bit in his interview with Oilers PR chief Bill Twilley. First thing Bill said, can you pronounce Russian? And I said, I speak it fluently. And that was it. <laughs> the assistant trainer is Lyle Sparky Kolchiski. Mark has always made sure he knew how to pronounce the names of the players. If he doesn't know, he asks. The coaches, believe it or not, sometimes don't even know what number a player wears, but the trainers and the massage therapists, you know, they know how to pronounce the fellow's name, and uh, that's where you get it from. And if you're really stuck, you, you go to the player himself. Ladies and gentlemen, led by number one, Peter Ng, the Edmonton Oilers. Mark loves his job. Most of us would be thrilled to watch Oilers games for nothing, but he actually gets paid for it. And another bonus is that he gets to meet many of the most famous people in the NHL. Mark, 11 years of doing this job, there must have been a few embarrassing moments that you can tell us about. Uh, it was late in the game, and the Oilers had tied the game. Mark Messier scored the goal, so I'm writing down on the sheet of paper, Oilers goal, Edmonton, number 11, and I put Mark Lewis. I turned the microphone on, Oilers goal scored by number 11, Mark Lewis, and I said, oh my God, and you know what happens then. You know? His third goal and seventh point scored on the power play by number 85, Peter Klima. Into the game and get him roused. Do you think that's part of your job? I think it is. I think the mistakes have been few and far between for Mark Lewis as he's grown to become a part of Oiler hockey for the thousands of fans who follow the team. It's, it's kind of nice that I can slip out of here and no one knows who I am. Not anymore. Not anymore. That's right. Tomorrow on Eyewitness, we'll take you directly into the penalty box during an Oiler game. Corey Elliott, CFRN Eyewitness Sports. Well, Mark does a first-class job for the Oilers. You know, that infamous video replay was the center of controversy last night in New York in a game that saw the Rangers beat Pittsburgh. When I return later in our Eyewitness Hour, we'll show you the play in question and let you decide if the call was right. Daryl? Thanks, Al. Weatherman John Barry was right on the money with today. But four minutes left in a tie game, the rest was controversy. Koster took a drop pass from Leach and ripped a shot from the low slot. It whistled by Tom Barrasso's glove and apparently missed the net. The replay official was consulted and he ruled a goal which was backed up by referee Terry Gregson. Now the slow-mo shows the puck did go right through the net. Right near ice level, although Scotty Bowman was incensed and goalie Barrasso was ejected from the game shortly after, the magic of technology shows it was, in fact, a legitimate goal. Well, the financially troubled Winnipeg Jets got a new lease on life today with the announcement of a proposed multi-million dollar deal to keep them in the city of Winnipeg. Peter Young reports that the deal involved the city and the Manitoba provincial government. We can say to the entire Jets organization, to the people of Winnipeg, we're here for six years. It's not a year, it's not two years, it's a long-term position. A new arena or upgrading of the existing rink will likely determine if the present group of private owners will sell at the end of 94. In the interim, everyone involved in the organization, including the players, can now make long-term plans for the future. And there's a birthday party in Toronto tonight, not for a person, but for a building. Maple Leaf Gardens is 60 years old. It was back on November the 12th, 1931, a grand opening ceremony prior to the start of the NHL game between the Leafs and Chicago Blackhawks. Tickets ranged in price from 95 cents to $2.75, and 13,233 fans turned out the largest crowd to ever watch a sporting event in Toronto to that point in time. The Leafs, who were led by legends like King Clancy, Red Horner, and Charlie Conacher lost the game 2-1, but they did go on to win the Stanley Cup 
that very season. Meanwhile, in Montreal, the price tag for fixing up Olympic Stadium has risen by another $25 million, and that's just the cost of repairing the 50-ton beam that collapsed in September and fixing the rip in the roof. Now, over $2 billion taxpayer dollars have already been squandered on this controversial structure, and I'm wondering if it's ever going to end. And with ITV. The men at the top of the owner's organization have been forced to become a patient pair this season. The Edmonton roster has been completely renovated, rebuilt from the ground up. In fact, the faces are still changing places. Sometimes they look like the Oilers of old, a team that couldn't be stomped. But other nights have been much more forgettable. The new look Oilers are now looking for leadership from the old guard. Essa Tikkanen is taking charge, and he's leading by example. Craig Simpson is starting to score again. He's always an offensive threat. And the bottom line is Bill Ranford. Any Oilers success this season depends on their top goaltender. Tonight, the former champions Meet the defending champions live on ITV. The Oilers on ITV. Tonight's telecast is brought to you by Molson Canadian. What beer's all about. Mario Lemieux and the Pittsburgh Penguins celebrating their Stanley Cup victory almost six months ago. But this hasn't been a banner season so far in Pittsburgh. The most important piece of the Penguins puzzle is still number 66. And his old problem is back bothering him again. Already he's missed three games. However, teammate Paul Coffey has enjoyed some highlights. He's now the highest scoring defenseman in NHL history. Tonight, Coffey, Lemieux, and the Pittsburgh Penguins take on the Edmonton Oilers. Good evening and welcome to our telecast from the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh. I'm Tim Spellacy. Well, the Edmonton Oilers Palm Springs vacation ended with a thud late Tuesday afternoon when the players learned that their popular teammate, defenseman Jeff Boogaboo, had been traded to the New York Rangers in exchange for defenseman David Shaw. There had been rumors for the past couple of weeks, but still the announcement was quite a shock. David Shaw joined the Oilers this morning, and he will be in the lineup for tonight's hockey game. That's just been confirmed. The Oilers are continuing a six-game road trip that began last Friday with a loss to the San Jose Sharks and then a tie in Los Angeles last Saturday, a game the Oilers should have won. Tomorrow, they're heading across the state of Pennsylvania to meet the Flyers, and it's up to the province of Quebec, and the road trip wraps up Monday in Montreal. Despite their problems, the Oilers haven't lost that much ground in the Smite division. They are still within firing distance of the Jets, the Kings, the Flames. Only the Vancouver Canucks are pulling away. Here in Pittsburgh, the serious illness of head coach Bob Johnson has been well documented. He is back in Colorado following the team by television. And so far, it's been a disappointing season for the defending Stanley Cup champions. Just two wins here at the Civic Arena and a record of only 500. Right now, they are stalled in fourth place in the Patrick Division. And at this early stage of the season, they are well back of the pack. Now, two standouts from last season are back in the Pittsburgh lineup with substantial new contracts. Mark Recchi, though, is struggling somewhat while Kevin Stevens is producing. Now, with more on the Pittsburgh Penguins, here's our colleague, Harry Neal, and our former colleague, now the interim head coach in Pittsburgh, Scotty Bowman. Tim, Scotty Bowman's trying to win his 746th game as an NHL coach tonight here against the Oilers. As I've traveled around the league uh, this year, Scotty, I've heard you're doing a great job, but you're mellowing. Now, I'd like to see you take a look at this tape and explain this action. Well, I was looking at the, <laughs> unfortunately, I was looking at the uh, replay right in the center of the screen. I wasn't trying to jump over the ice. And I've seen it before, Harry, but uh, we were upset with a goal that the Rangers scored, as you know. And we can blame it on television because the television had me right up on the center screen in Madison Square Garden. <laughs> well, you've always wanted to make it big in New York. And now that you're coaching and not broadcasting, can you give me uh, some insight into the difference between the two? 
Well, you know, Harry, I couldn't figure it out. When I was uh, broadcasting, I used to sit up there and say, how come this team or that team can't keep the puck out of its net? I found pretty early how hard it is. It's easier upstairs. But I think when you look at it, it you know, it's a lot easier uh, to have one producer yelling in your ear what you're doing, you're getting off the air or something, than 20 players asking you for ice time. <laughs> and that's what I've had. All right, thanks, Scotty. Good luck tonight. Back to you, Tim. I'm sure he misses the TV business. Coming up. The first meeting of the regular season for the Edmonton Oilers and the Pittsburgh Penguins. A special guest in attendance tonight. Let's join the rest of our telecast team. And here's Bruce Buchanan. Bruce. Thanks, Tim. And good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh. This is the first of three games this season we'll have on ITV featuring defending Stanley Cup champions, the Penguins and the Edmonton Oilers. Both teams have just arrived on the ice. We will have a special ceremony tonight. And there's a special hockey player, Harry Neal, Mario Lemieux. Well, for the Oilers to win tonight, here is what they have to try and stop the Penguins from doing. Coffee coming late on rushes through the neutral zone. He's almost impossible to handle in that play. On the power play, they've got to eliminate that diagonal cross-ice pass to Lemieux or Mullen or Yager or Stevens or one of those guys that can really shoot it. And they know that Lemieux leaves the defensive zone early and looks for that long pass from the best long passer in hockey, Paul Coffey. The Oilers, to win, have to try and get these things done themselves. Go to the net all the time without the puck against this defense. It's the weakest part of the Penguin team. Make sure that they aren't outnumbered in the neutral zone against the Penguins. They're a dangerous team in the rush. And if any player goes to Lemieux or Coffey anywhere on the ice, you have to stay with him until your team gets the puck back. And that's easy to say and hard to do. And get after the Pittsburgh defense. Bill Ranford will start in goal tonight for the Edmonton Oilers, who have to hope that the Penguins continue to struggle at home. They have not played well here at the Civic Arena, and the Oilers playing the third of a six-game road trip and feeling fairly confident after a good effort in Los Angeles Saturday where they skated to a 4-4 tie. Now we're ready for the special presentation. Mark the Mandel, Seltzer Plus Territory Award. representative of Miles and, and we'll go to the public address announcer at this point. Elka Seltzer Plus spokesman at Hockey Hall of Fame member Dennis Potvan to present the NHL Alka Seltzer Plus Award to Penguin defenseman Gordy Roberts. <laughs> He captured the honor with a plus 18 rating, the best on the Penguins last season. Alka-Seltzer Plus Cold Medicine will contribute $1,000 to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, Minnesota section, in recognition of his achievement. Congratulations, Gordy Roberts, the 1990-91 Penguin NHL Alka-Seltzer Plus Award winner. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Potvan would like to take this opportunity to personally congratulate Penguin defenseman Paul Coffey for eclipsing his NHL all-time records for most goals, assists, and points recorded by a defenseman in a career. Paul Coffey has passed Dennis's career marks of 310 goals, 742 assists, and 1,052 total points. Congratulations, Paul Coffey, on your outstanding achievement. Paul Coffey now with 1,065 career points. Tonight's game is up next. You're watching the Penguins and Oilers live on ITV. There's one thing that makes a person attractive. It's not their hair. Their face or their clothes. It's their attitude. Molson Canadian. What beer's all about. I have just a thing for that cold. Most kids think that medicine has to taste bad. There's one cold medicine that relieves both kids and cold symptoms. Dimetab. Grape-flavored Dimetap Elixir, recommended time after time by pediatricians and pharmacists. After all, a cold medicine can't work if you can't get it down. You like Dimetap? Grape-flavored Dimetap Elixir. It relieves kids, as well as cold symptoms.
you don't have to be a model to look good on the runway. To find true love. Or to light up the town. The new Mazda MX-3 Presidia with the only optional V6. Looks good on you. Edmonton Oilers and the Philadelphia Flyers are the spitting image of each other, soulmates, if you will, with no real offensive superstars. Both teams have to clutch and grab for every win that they can get, and there have not been a lot of those. Going into tonight's game, both the Oilers and the Flyers had fallen on hard times with only six wins apiece. Edmonton is in jeopardy of not winning a game on this six-game road trip. Tonight, they dropped another. Let's take a look at a few of the highlights. Weak shot, scramble in front. Manson clears it right to Lomakin. He gets the goal, and it's one to nothing. The Oilers on the power play now, but it's the Flyers with the better of the chances. Roddy Brindamore stopped in a slot by Billy Ranford, and then Steve Duchesne is stoned as well. Let's go to the second period. Martin Jelena takes the pass. He busts down the left side. Jelena pulls Reagan out of his net, but then he hits the mesh. The Flyers... Then go up two to nothing. Manson loses the puck. Ricci picks it up. Thank you very much to Roddy Brindamore in the slot. He catches the corner. That's his fifth of the year. Two to nothing. The Oilers get that one back in the power play. Simpson to Murphy to Dampo's shelf. He goes upstairs on Kenny Reggett. Two one. Great looking shot. Let's go to the third period. Billy Ranford playing tough. Ricci out in front to Deneen. But Bill Ranford comes up with another enormous save. Mark Howe back in the flyer lineup. He will beat Ranford with the hard, low snapshot, but it goes off the goalpost. The Oilers pull the goalie for the extra attacker, but it doesn't work. Kevin Deneen gets the empty netter as he scores in his first game as a member of the Philadelphia Flyers. The final in the contest, 3-1 for Philly. It was Andre Lomack and Roddy Brindamore and Kevin Deneen. Mike Ricci had two points in the game for the Oilers. It was Vinny Damfus. The Flyers have shot Edmonton 28 to 25, the Oil fall to 0-3 and 1 on their six-game road trip. Their next game will be in Quebec as they take on the Nords. How about the Flames and the Canucks? They lock horns tonight. We'll pick it up early in the first. The Flames open up the scoring. Two on one. McGinnis gets the goal as McLean goes down. He slides it underneath him, and it's one to nothing. A couple of minutes later, the Canucks come back to tie the game. Larry Ann up in front of court. Now, the first shot is stopped. The second is not. He gets the goal. 1-1. The Canucks then go up by a score. Two to one. Mad scramble in front, Pavel Bure, the spinorama. He beats Vernon, and it's 2-1. to one. Great chance for Vancouver to go up by two. Igor Larianov goes in all alone, but Vernon makes the save as he shuts the door. Let's go to the second period. The Flames tie it up with the only goal of the period. Gary Roberts breaks down the wing after a poor line change. He blows it by McLean, and it's 2 all in the third period. Trevor Linden goes in on the breakaway. Asiki's all over him. Linden gets the shot off, but Vernon makes the save. Then a mismatch. Timmy Hunter will drop the gloves with Jim Sandlack. Sandlack had no choice, and then he hung on, wisely doing so. The final of the game was a 2-2 OT tie. Good hockey game tonight. Both clubs were wheeling out there for the Canucks. It was Courtnell and Bure for the Flames, McInnes and Gary Roberts. By the way, Vancouver outshot Calgary in their own barn. 34 to 29. How about the Kings and the Sabres? And for the first time in 10 games, Los Angeles will open up the scoring. Thomas Sandstrom beats Pupa one to nothing. Seconds later, two on one. Randy Gillen to Luke Robitaille. He's having a great season thus far. His 12th goal of the year. Kings up by two. Second period. Kelly Rudy kept the Sabres off the board on the power play. McGillney with the blast, but Rudy goes down and makes not one but two saves. Then watch Thomas Sandstrom. He clips Holler with his stick. See you later, Tommy. He was gone. Five-minute major. Toss from the game. The Sabres' best chance on the power play comes when Kenny Sutton drives to the net. But again, Rudy is there to make the save. Buffalo will finally get on the board in the third period. McGillney will try the shot. Sharp angle. The rebound's there for Donald Adet. He bangs it home. That makes it 2-1. to one. It is now 2-2 two -two in the third period of play. Buffalo has just tied the game up for the Kings so far at Sandstrom and Robitaille. We know the Sabres have 
got their lone goal or their first goal from a debt. We don't know who scored their second one. We will update all the games as they continue. Okay, after back-to-back -back wins over the Oilers and the Islanders, the San Jose Sharks were flying high. Then along came the Sabres in a 7-1 loss tonight. The Sharks trying to regroup as they took on the red-hot Red Wings. Detroit had won four straight and six of eight in a super heavyweight tilt in this one. Let's take a look at the highlights now. First period, Sharks in the attack. Steve Bozak gets the goal one to nothing. Later on, the Sharks score again. Pallone walks in. He goes upstairs on Shevel. A great looking shot. Two zip. Then the scrap of the night. Bob Probert and the missing link. Link Gates drop the glove. Away they go. Top of your screen. Zoom in. And this was a good kill. As I said, two super heavyweights trading the punches back and forth.